uh, the, the, the writing which Jonathan has done uh, covers is it defies categorization, and that's one of the things perhaps we can we can probe a little later on. He began, I suppose, with things which might be thought of as science fiction, elements of detective fiction, gun with occasional music. Um, one of my favorite of novels of his is another book which in many ways is which is also detective fiction in a sense, Motherless Brooklyn, but he's gone far beyond that. Um, some people describe his recent book, Dissident Gardens, is period drama, but it's period drama unlike anything you've ever known. So let me not hold you back from uh, Jonathan Leatham. I'm looking forward to the lecture, and after we've had that, for uh, uh, at the end of that, there'll be time for some questions, time for some uh, answers, hopefully. And at the end of it all, there are books outside which you can buy and which uh, Jonathan will be very happy to, to sign. So let me now call upon Jonathan and put your hands together for him. Please. Thank you for that. Um, very nice introduction and, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, so, uh, words are not paint. Um, why did I call the lecture this, and what am I getting at? Well, I'll try to explain myself. Um, the the um, story of my relationship to cultural references is also, in many ways, the story of my coming of age, or my arrival, uh, very slow arrival in some ways, at the um, kinds of books that I write now, the kinds of novels that I write now, like Dissident Gardens, that most recent one that, that you mentioned. and. Um, a, a very unexpected and, and gradual emergence of a kind of style uh, loaded with cultural reference that I think is, is typical for better or worse of what, I, what I'm up to these days. Um, but I want to go ahead and, and, and walk it all the way back and explain um, what paint is doing in the title of the lecture. And, um, and to do that I have to talk about my, my childhood and the beginning of my impulse to um, well, not, not so much to create books or stories or novels, because I didn't know that I wanted to do that, but a much more elemental uh, impulse, which was to create anything at all. Um, my father is a painter, and, and I grew up, as a, as a young boy, I grew up uh, drawing and painting because it was, uh, it was, available to me, it was obvious to me, it was, a, it was in my environment. I mean, some of my earliest um, memories are of myself either getting into my father's studio while he was painting, or trying and failing to get into my father's studio while he was painting. And some of the first pictures of me are of me, you know, propped up at the wall, kind of imitating his movements as he painted. It was a very elemental part of, uh, of, of my you know, environment. It was probably, in some ways, a kind of pre-verbal interest of mine. And his paintings were always around us in the house, and his friends were painters, and we went to museums and galleries, and so uh, I was surrounded. In some ways, the way every child is surrounded by language, I was surrounded by visual language as well. Now, of course, that doesn't mean people weren't talking or telling stories in my immediate environment. And actually, um, my, my parents had a lot of wonderful books around. My mother was very verbal, kind of um, a, a bon vivant, very charismatic, great talker. Um, uh, when, she, when she worked, she was mostly just a, a, a parent, but when she worked, she was a social worker, and she basically was someone who, who talked to people for a living. Um, but I was immersed in this visual language that, that originated with my, my dad's artworks. And I loved it. I responded to it. It was very, um, it was felt very uh, familiar and intimate and exciting to me. And when I began to go to school and look for the things at school that interested me or that would impress my my teachers, uh, help me carve out a kind of a particular uh, identity, suggest a talent. Um, it turned out I was, you know. I was good at drawing and painting. Um, 
I'd inherited a lot of my father's facility, his hand-eye coordination, his, uh, his interest in color, his interest in form. And now, this was the kind of interest in color and form that's exhibited by a five-year-old or a six-year-old. I mean, I was still making childish art, but I loved doing it, and I, and I, I always seemed to be able to impress my art teachers. And in turn, I was able to take stuff home um, that impressed my parents. And so I, at a very young age, I had this idea that um, I was meant to, to make paintings um, or, or, or sculpture or drawings. Um, it, was, it was an easy identity to latch on to. Now, you know, most, most people who become writers, the story is typically that of having to fight your way out of a more conventional expectation. You know, the parents who, um, in a gentle way or in a not so gentle way, are hoping that you'll become an upstanding member of society, which is to say a doctor or a lawyer or a businessman or, or in some other way be secure, be able to make a living, be able to take a place in society. To, be, to live a creative life is very desirable and, and inspiring, but it's also very threatening uh, because it's amorphous. It doesn't have, it's not anchored in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the world. It doesn't have uh, a very definite purpose. You know, American society is very deeply utilitarian. Um, we like things to be for something. We like things to be productive. And artists live this uh, threateningly obscure life. It's insecure. Uh, they're inventing things that no one has any clear purpose for. Um, and so many people who want to become writers uh, have to find some way to justify themselves. Uh, and it takes a while in choosing to go off into, uh, you know, wherever it is, into these quiet rooms and isolation and, and just make, make things up, make up stories and novels or essays or poems. and and claim that the identity is, you know, is a defining one. A lot of people are told when they're first told that they, when they first declare that they'd like to write, they're told, well, that's very nice, but what are you actually going to do? You know, how are you going to have, how are you going to make a living? What's your real job going to be? And, um, and of course, in fact, many writers, like many other artists, have to do other things to make a living. It isn't, uh, it isn't a really great prospect for, for, um, securing yourself in the world and paying the rent or, you know, having, a, having health insurance or security day to day. I didn't have that disadvantage. Because of my father's life as an artist and my parents' environment, the world that I grew up in was a kind of bohemian one, where there were a lot of people who had quite confidently declared themselves to be artists of one kind or another. Um, this wasn't a really obscure choice for me. I actually felt encouraged in many ways to, cram, to claim a creative identity for myself. But the one that was available, the obvious one, the one that I was beginning to exhibit some talent for, was this uh, visual arts. Um, you know, I was a, I was a prodigy with, with, a, with a paintbrush or a pencil. I, in, in high school, I began to do sculpture. I actually carved marble for a while. And I would bring home these giant marble heads from school, the way, the way other kids might bring home homework. Uh, and um, I got into college initially on the strength, really, of uh, a portfolio of drawings, because it was what I'd spent most of my time doing growing up. Well, that's not, that's not actually true. I'd spent an inordinate amount of time also consuming all sorts of other things besides paintings and sculptures. I was making paintings and sculptures, but I was reading voraciously. I was reading novels by the bushel. I was going to films, both new ones and old ones. I was blessed in that New York City in, in the 70s, in the early 80s, was loaded with um, movie houses that showed classic Hollywood, that showed art films. Uh, there was the Quad, there was the Film Forum. Um, there was the Thalia, and I would go and see all of Godard or all of Stanley Kubrick. You know, uh, I had this appetite for, for these narrative forms. I was a comic book reader, and I collected them. And I, I, again, I read new ones and I read old ones. I went to shops and bought tattered copies of comic books from the 50s and 60s. And I, uh, 
I read Mad Magazine. But I still thought that I was meant to be in the mold of my father. I was meant to be a painter. I was meant to enter the world of the fine arts. And there were a number of things that I absorbed from his milieu and from the assumptions that surrounded his activities as a, a painter, a painter with the aspiration to be shown in galleries and museums. Um, uh, uh, the fine arts atmosphere was one that exalted a certain kind of high aspiration, modernist aspiration to make, um, you know, sublime things. And this seemed divorced in many ways from a lot of my other enthusiasms. The kind of painting that I would look at in the museums and the kind of painting that my father was trying to make didn't seem to me to have a tremendous amount to do with the kind of excitement, even if it was often the visual excitement, that I was experiencing when I went to see uh, you know, a uh, Orson Welles film or read a Jack Kirby comic book. And it didn't seem clearly connected to my appetite for fiction, because the kinds of stories I was reading at that time were mostly, not exclusively, but mostly uh, really plotty and really colorful and really strange. And some of them were really pulpy. I liked surreal stories. I liked science fiction. I liked crime stories. I liked, um, I liked horror stories. I would read Shirley Jackson or Raymond Chandler. I would read Philip K. Dick. And then I would discover these sort of literary things, but they seemed to me to be connected to this gothic appetite I had. I would read Kafka, or I discovered a Polish writer named Stanislaw Lem, or eventually I discovered Italo Calvino, who, who seemed to me deeply related to the science fiction and to the comic books I was reading. None of this seemed to be exactly the same kind of art aspiration that was indicated by my father's painting. My father was born in uh, 1932, and he came of age at a time when to want to paint in America was very specifically to want to become an abstract expressionist. That's a generation of paintings, of painters like Rothko or Jackson Pollock, um, or Franz Klein, or Robert Motherwell, who would make these immense abstractions, deep, profound, strange, modernist art. Um, this was an art that aspired to uh, being formally radical. It was... Um, usually philosophically informed. It was understood to express the deepest kinds of uh, experiences of human alienation or existential uh, perplexity. It wasn't like Mad Magazine at all. <laughs> and it wasn't like science fiction at all. And it wasn't even really like Franz Kafka. What it was like, in some ways, was, was uh, well, evoked for me by the, this, the famous quote that all art aspires to the condition of music. And of course by that they didn't mean the music that I was listening to on the radio. They didn't mean, you know, the doors or talking heads. They meant classical music, you know, a Beethoven symphony. And that is to say that the abstract painting that formed the philosophical foundation of my father's art practice, even when he actually began painting figures, because like a lot of abstract painters, in his generation, um, people moved back to painting uh, figures and objects and elements in the paintings. Um, and he was part of that movement. Um, but the underpinning of it was this idea that, mo that modernist art, great art, art you could be proud of, had this purity of intention that kind of was self-exalting. It was purged of uh, timely references or, or uh, petty human materials in favor of something universal and, um, and extraordinary that just spoke across, uh, across boundaries of culture and time. And 
a lot of this other stuff that I was really responsive to was kind of, you know, well, one word that people use for it is popular culture. Another word that gets thrown around is pulp. And both those terms seem to contain some kind of judgment or, or um, qualification. They suggest that these things are kind of interesting but stuck in, in, the, in the mire of the everyday, the commercial, the, the vernacular. And these were things I liked about this stuff, but it was also very easy for me to feel um, as an inheritor of a certain kind of modernist ambition, that to want to be an artist was to want to be a great artist, that these things were embarrassing. They were problematic. They were too, um, they were too prosaic. Well, I began to change. And the first change that I experienced was I realized that as much as I loved painting and sculpture, and I was proud of my ability to make paintings and sculptures that you know, garnered at least the attention of my art teachers and, and impressed my dad's painter friends, that actually I was way too much into narrative materials to remain um, a, a visual artist with the aspiration of making objects that would be located in galleries or, or museums. That actually, I was really um, much more engaged with language than that, um, but also engaged with time. It seemed to me that one of the problems, one of the limits or obstacles for me in my um, commitment to paintings, to making paintings and sculptures, was that they didn't move through time. They just sat there. They defied time. But actually, I wanted to talk about time, and I wanted to think about time. When you see a film, or listen to a song, or read a short story, or read a comic book, you're in a relationship to time. You turn the pages. The artwork evolves. Now, it may, like a film, evolve at a fixed pace. When you sit in a theater and the film unfolds, you're not in charge. It takes two hours, or if it's a Tarkovsky film, it takes four hours, or wherever it takes. If you read a comic book or a novel, you're the operator. You speed it up or slow it down. You turn the pages. You decide when your eye skips from one panel to the next. Anyway, these issues, these questions of how you could relate to time in an artwork were enormously involving for me. And at the same time, language had lit up for me. From all my reading and from listening to my mother and my father and their friends talk and to living on the streets of New York as a kid and hearing the different kinds of cultural negotiation that were being con conducted and transacted by the different kinds of human beings I was running into on the streets, I was alive with language in a way that no painting or sculpture could satisfy. I started to need to emit language. I wanted to talk back. And I wanted to do it, um, well, I wanted to do it in a lot of ways, but I realized at a certain point I wanted to do it by making up characters who could say things I wouldn't say or say things that I was embarrassed to say. So I started to look initially for a happy medium. My next ambition, after I sort of very, in a very awkward gesture, because I was afraid my father would be disappointed in me, I began to shrug off the ambition of becoming a painter or a sculptor. In favor, I thought of one of these hybrid forms. You know, it was a kind of a self-diagnosis. Look, I'm really good at visual stuff, and I'm trained in it, but I also want to do storytelling and language. I'll be a filmmaker, or I'll be a comic book artist. You know, both of these things seem to me to combine the verbal and the visual material in a very natural way. So I spent a couple of years, 16 years old, 17 years old, kind of uh, flirting with filmmaking. I made an animated film at one point. I tried to write a screenplay. I was trying to draw comic books. Um, but soon, in a way, my relationship to language became even more predominant than that, and I started writing short stories. Awkward, inadequate inept. I mean, in, in fact, compared to the way I was a kind of trained art prodigy, my earliest short stories were pathetic by comparison. I was not someone who would have, you know, made a great impression on an English teacher if I'd been showing them the short stories I was writing in my teenage years, whereas I could get a lot of easy attention and, and uh, encouragement for my art. I had only myself to, to uh, nourish this interest because I was not writing very well at first. 
Um, but there was something that happened when I began to write short stories, and I think in some way I had simply located my vocation. Um, okay, so the words are not paint. What did I have yet to learn? I figured out what I really wanted to do. I wanted to write short stories and novels. In fact, I began a novel when I was 19 years old that was so captivating to me that it overwhelmed my um, every other commitment in my life, including that of being a college student. I dropped out of college at 19 to write fiction. And I basically never looked back. But there was something in my work that was not resolved or solved. There was something in my um, relationship to language and culture that was um, incomplete for a long time after that. It wasn't just that I had to get a lot better, although I had to get a lot better. The novel I began at age 19 wasn't any good. It took me three years to finish it, and I almost immediately knew to throw it away. I mean, I, I didn't. I parked it in a, in a desk drawer. But um, it was never to be published, and it, it would never make sense for it to be published, because it, it, it was only a place for me to uh, grow and learn and experience uh, the relationship to these materials of, of, of prose and, 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 and narrative fiction. It wasn't something anyone else would ever want to read. Um, but apart from getting better, there was this other problem that I inherited. It was an interesting problem um, that limited my work for a, a, a great while. Or uh, even, even when it didn't limit it, it defined it in a strange way. And that's really the subject of, of, of this, um, this talk. And that is, I still believed in some way that it was a more exalted thing to create art that was in some way free of cultural reference. I believed, because I'd been trained as a painter and because I'd inherited in, in the background this modernist ideal of doing things that were kind of timeless and transcendent and um, full of um, universal expressivity rather than kind of local remarks. Like Mad Magazine is full of local remarks. It's, you know, making fun of the newest movie that came out, right? Well, you wouldn't want to do that in a serious novel or story. You wouldn't want to talk about anything that was so time-bound as a movie that happened to be playing down the street. You'd ignore that kind of material in favor of something more like classical music or an abstract painting. You would try to make stories that were as epic and timeless and free, not hidebound by cultural reference. This, I believed, was my job. Well, it was a very strange, uh, a very strange limitation to put on the, the kind of work I wanted to do. Um, but I did try to honor it in certain respects. The first few novels I wrote, well, in one sense, they were very culturally specific because I did write out of my uh, enthusiasm for, for well, but my, my, my introduction explained this. I wrote partly out of my enthusiasm for crime stories and science fiction stories. And also I was writing out of my, my interest in a slightly more literary version of the same thing. Kafka, George Orwell, Stanislaw Lem. Um, you know, at that time, when I, when I set out, in a way my model, the writer that I, who was alive and working, who seemed to me to have done exactly what I wanted to do, who I wanted to be the most, was someone like Paul Auster, who got to make reference to, um, to these vernacular genre materials, but to be taken immediately for a very pure and poetic uh, and kind of universal artist, and taken very seriously the way paintings in a museum are taken very seriously. Um, I believed it was necessary to find my way to a combination of, of these elements that um, would have a, a kind of uh, universal modularity, that wouldn't be stuck in cultural reference. And so when my characters, for instance, wanted to mention a book or a movie, which sometimes they did, because growing up the way I had, I was very interested in people who liked culture. <laughs> I liked books and movies, and everyone I knew did, and it, it seemed to me, or songs on the radio, it seemed to me that my characters were going to sometimes want to think about that stuff. But I, I thought that my job was always to make it up. So if my character listened to a song, I would make up a fictional song for them to listen to. And if they made reference to anything uh, 
in culture, it had to be fictional as well. Because I thought by surrounding cultural reference with invention, it would become expressive, it would become timeless, it would become more like classical music or an abstract painting. It would be, I would flood the area with invention and transformation in order to earn my freedom to suggest that these characters live the way I did in, in a realm of cultural specifics. Well, that's a lot of extra work I was assigning myself. <laughs> Sometimes it was really fun and really interesting and, and, and lively. Sometimes it also meant that I just left things really vague to avoid the references. Anyway, it certainly gave my first few books a particular flavor. They existed in a kind of parallel universe, a dreamlike space where there was just less specificity because no one could ever possibly make up as much specificity as actually exists. You just can't do it. You can't you know, you can't make up an implicit fictional world that's as full of things and people and strangeness and, 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 and histories, legacies, connections, interconnections, intertextualities, as the real world presents us with all the time, everywhere we go. Um, so I would just leave that stuff out. The books took on a flavor. Well, uh, Paul Auster is a point of comparison. They had a kind of archetypal, dreamlike quality to them. Not something I was um, unhappy to attain, and I think that uh, that for a little while was my signature. What happened next? What was the change that I was waiting to, to discover? Well, I came up with an idea for a book that was, like one of my earlier books, uh, connected to the idea, the image of the hard-boiled detective. I loved Raymond Chandler, I loved Dashiell Hammett, and I, I had written a, a novel called Gun with Occasional Music, which was about a hardball detective in a kind of weird Orwellian dystopian future. But now I had a different idea. I wanted to write about a hardball detective who wasn't hardboiled at all because he had Tourette syndrome. Uh, and, I mean, what, what is the defining feature of the hardball detective is that uh, although he may be outgunned and outnumbered and uh, he doesn't know the answer to the mystery, what he has is his poise, he has control, he has command. He's Humphrey Bogart. He enters a room and instantly runs a kind of verbal ring around whom, whomever he encounters. Well, what if my character was the opposite of Humphrey Bogart, was totally chaotic and out of control, had no mastery of his social or verbal presence? I thought that would be a very amusing and strange situation, and I, and I, and I was very excited about writing it. But I also wanted to set it in a world where, uh, well, the world where Tourette syndrome really exists, which is the present. I was discovering it, it seemed to me, a deeply specific and social condition. Uh, it would really, you know, if you, if you research it, as I was doing then, it, it, it was clear that in many ways it was only just being understood. Oliver Sacks had written these essays and kind of introduced people to the idea of, of Tourette's. It was, um, you know, uh, medically had only been clearly identified as a neurological disorder rather than a, a psychological condition, a kind of madness, um, quite, quite recently. So I needed to put this story in the present so that it would be socially legible. And I was also very excited at that time because I'd made a return in my life after many years of exile, I'd made a return to Brooklyn where I was from. And I started to want to put this detective with Tourette's into Brooklyn. Um, now, I was really, in many ways, sneaking up on myself there. I had no idea how big a decision I was making by beginning to write about where I'd grown up. Because, in fact, it became a major subject, the dominant subject in my work. And truthfully, the thing that I seem most likely to be associated with, if anyone has any associations for me at all, it's, oh, you're that Brooklyn guy. Well, I didn't do that right away. I wrote four novels that had nothing to do with New York City or Brooklyn before I even attempted it the first time. Um, but it became an overwhelming commitment in my work and one I can only embrace. I mean, it's, you know, uh, um, it's been so, uh, such, an, such a unexpectedly deep engagement, so rich, so nourishing, and so rewarding. People who know that place see it in the terms that I have presented now. And that's, you know, to, to do that to your own hometown is quite, it's quite an extraordinary experience. Um, 
But at first it was a casual gesture. I thought, well, I'm living in Brooklyn now. I'm feeling excited about it. I'm remembering this place. Let's plop this detective with Tourette's right down here on the streets where I grew up. And um, now the thing about Tourette's that really interested me, and again, I was sort of sneaking up on myself here, was the way it connected the inside of the character to the outside. Because really it's about a kind of boundary failure. The person with Tourette's not only goes around saying what they're thinking uh, against their own will, but characteristically, they're full of inadvertent uh, connections. They make, they free associate, and they sometimes do it with their actual body. They touch things they shouldn't touch. They reach out and they give names to feelings that are, that are inside them. They also identify what they're seeing around them, sometimes rather helplessly, sometimes quite, you know, uh, disconcertingly. Um, the reason they're, they're so, um, such a rich subject for fiction is because they're turning themselves inside out, and by doing so, they turn their environment inside out. The reason we're uncomfortable around people with Tourette and make, make it so hard for them, in turn, is that they're making us see that we're walking around bottled up all the time, that we're stopping all these reactions, that we're not reaching out and touching everything around us. Well, in some way, I was catching, by wanting to write about Tourette's, I was catching it. I was getting so excited about it that it became a kind of um, involuntary experience for me as well. And in the, in the, on the pages of the book, when I began to write this novel, Mother Was Brooklyn, about this character with Tourette's, I realized one of the things he wanted to do was name stuff in my books that I had never named before. So he was walking around the streets of Brooklyn, and for the first time I gave, I, I put my characters on a real grid. He wasn't just somewhere in Brooklyn, he was on the corner of Dean Street and Nevins. And then he'd walk down to Smith Street, and then he'd buy a sandwich from a sandwich shop that had a specific name. And I found that there was something about the tone of voice, the psychological, <coughs> Uh, framework for this character that demanded real names. So I began to name real parts of Brooklyn in the story. The other thing that he liked to do was compare things to other things. And he wanted to say, for instance, and he does say in the book, um, I love the song Kiss by Prince. Because when I hear it, it makes me it makes me think that Prince has Tourette's, and it makes me feel like I'm not alone. <laughs> and he wanted to say, I love Don Martin's cartoons from Mad Magazine. And there is a page in the story where he talks about what he likes about Don Martin's cartoons from Mad Magazine, which is, again, that they connect to his syndrome. They make him feel that the way he feels nervous in his body has been recognized and identified by the, the way Don Martin draws his characters. So here I was suddenly breaking my law. The words were not paint. They wanted to make reference to the world around them. And, well, now, anyone who's even remotely familiar with what came next in my own writing life <coughs> will know how crucial a, a transformation this was. It was an accidental one. But what I was next to do was to write a very large, very, at, at that point, very uncharacteristically autobiographical novel about growing up in Brooklyn called The Fortress of Solitude. And this book was nothing if not exploding with cultural specifics. At every point, in order to pin these characters to the page and say what they were feeling in their inmost souls, I had to say what song was on the radio. Not, a, not an imaginary one that I made up. I had to talk about, play that funky music, White Boy, by, White, by Wild Cherry. Or I had to talk about going to see a Charles Bronson film at an exploitation theater on Court Street in, you know, on a certain summer afternoon in 1978. It was the only way I could crack the material open was to just smother the pages with cultural references. I had to violate my prohibition utterly. And, you know, one of the things that happened actually was people began to ask me the question, was I worried that this would render the books, uh, you know, would it, would, it, would it damage their accessibility or their universality? So the, the anxiety that I was carrying around with me wasn't something I'd made up totally out of whole cloth. 
it in, in fact immediately generated this concern from the outside. People would say, well, I really like this book and I really understood this character, but don't you worry that a hundred years from now no one will know what, you know, play that funky music white boy sounds like and your, your story won't work anymore? And I had to think about it. I had to, you know, in a way I had to defend what had become a necessary decision. It was more than a decision. It was a whole new style of working for me. And I, I sought and located my, my defense in um, a writer that I had been reading a lot of in the period just before, and I suddenly realized had informed this work very directly, and that was Charles Dickens. So I thought about the experience of reading, you know, a book like Dombey and Son or, or Great Expectations. And I realized Dickens at every point drowns you in 1840s, 1830s London. He just gives you everything. Every street name, you know, the advertising jingles that people are singing in the shops, the, the scraps of newspaper headlines, the, the recent true crime stories that are, people are gossiping about on street corners. He never hesitates to just overwhelm you with what that city was like for him at that time. And the reason it all works is not because you understand it all or you recognize it all or you can translate every reference, but because for him, every reference is emotionally charged. It's alive. It's nervous with his quality of alertness to his character's existence in a human world. And I began to think, it isn't that one needs to know or understand or relate to um, every name, every specific, every reference on the page. It's that they have to be electrified by the consciousness of the writer into something, animated into a world that the reader can become immersed in, much as we are immersed in our own world without understanding everything we hear around us. And in fact, that became one of the subjects of the work itself. The Fortress of Solitude is as much a book about failing to understand the cultural surround that you move through every day as it is a book about grasping it or mastering it. When the boy, you know, kind of comes to consciousness in 1970s New York, that place is as alive, as overwhelming, as opaque, as chaotic as Dickens' London. <laughs> the, advertising, the torn advertising signs in the subway stations where a sheet of paper has been pulled to reveal three different layers of advertising and then someone else has come along and drawn some graffiti on it, which makes a reference to a neighborhood or a gang or a housing project. All of these codes, these layers of language and culture are the world that we move through, especially for city dwellers in the 20th, 20th and now the 21st century when we channel surf, when we hear the radio, when we get into a taxi cab that has talk radio in the front seat and a screen to entertain us in the back seat, and we're passing signage, we are drowning in a world of cultural references. It is a form of realism to free associate and disassociate among an incomprehensible realm of languages, some of which are pointed at us some of which are lost on us totally. And so I began to think, this is the paint. <laughs> you know, in writing about the human lives that I've known, in writing about the worlds I've moved through, the world I came of age inside, that I'm still grappling with, um, that's the palette. Cultural reference is the stuff of, of narrative, it's a stuff of experience, it's a stuff of consciousness. We're not, you know, um, we don't have the privilege of, of aspiring to the condition of music. Our consciousness is not like a Mark Rothko painting, a simple field of color emanating in a void. We are stuck, for better or worse, inside a gabble of languages vernacular, exalted, banal, every day, the voices of the people around us, um, the voices we appropriate and cobble together in order to make 
our own language, whatever our own personal language is meant to be. And so I, this was the transformation that I was waiting to have and waiting to experience in my work that completed me as a writer. And it's been my subject ever since. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, in a sense, dominates my view of human experience that I believe we are a kind of collage, fragmentary collage of appropriated voices, not because we are <coughs> devoid and defunct, empty, postmodern, uh, you know, blank slates with no fundamental emotional or psychological or spiritual dynamic of our own, but because the way we arrive <laughs> is to navigate a realm of chaotic languages and uh, navigate and negotiate with them. They can't be ignored in favor of some, some absolute or pure expressivity. It doesn't mean I don't still think Beethoven or, um, or Mark Rothko have something beautiful to say to me, but I no longer believe that if I could find that equivalent in prose fiction, it would make any sense or mean anything uh, better than what I can do with this, you know, fragmented legacy of, of cultural stuff. All these references are, are my paint, um, ultimately, uh, as much as I held them at bay for so long. Um, I think that that's probably a great place to stop and welcome your questions um, uh, of any, uh, any, any kind that you'd like. And if, I guess we'll yeah. move over here and, yeah, and, and sit together. Thank you very much. Jonathan, that was a wonderful talk. And um, you know, it really um, you know, got us into the, the mind of yourself as a writer and your evolution as a, as a writer. Um, could I ask you to, um, you know, to, just to try and tease out from some of the things you've said, something that might be relevant to, you know, I know I've seen a number of Singapore writers here in the, in the audience. Um, and I think one of the things which uh, y you've, you know, you've come to is that, you know, you make the world your own specific world come alive with all of its complexities, all of the, the, the references around you, um, as specific as, as one can be. And that's, you know, that's what convinces the reader and brings, brings the reader in. Um, for Singapore writers, perhaps they face um, one additional hurdle that you may not. I mean, uh, you know, everyone in the world probably wants to go to New York or be a New Yorker. Um, it can't, same can't be said for Singapore. So, you know, the cultural references, m maybe one day, but the, the, the cultural references that surround the American life or the, or the uh, New York life, uh, people are familiar with through Hollywood or MTV and so on. But for us, you know, for, for Singaporeans, um, a Singaporean writer, if you write about chicken rice, mm. you have now discovered it, but um, you know, many uh, Americans will just not understand it. Yeah. So how does a writer cope with that, or do you just not worry about it? Well, yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. Of course, I do, um, I do have the benefit, and, and, and at some level it's probably uh, very hard for me to even get outside of it enough to, to examine it, of working in a kind of um, dominant cultural language. Because the, the imagery of uh, American 20th century culture has become so globally dominant. Um, and of course, uh, even before that, and this, isn't, this is not necessarily, uh, for some, some Singapore writers, this is not a, a limitation. But I mean, I'm often made aware, when I'm in Europe, for example, that I work in the obnoxiously dominant language. English is also a kind of monolith itself, even putting America aside. Mm. Now some, some, you know, you, you're, the English spoken here is very elegant actually, and, and I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure I have not read enough contemporary uh, literature from Singapore, but that um, that's reflected in the, the English language literature generated here. But one thing I'm always e very eager to, to point out to people in any conversation about America from outside its boundaries is that you don't feel centrally American or simply uh, and holistically American when you're, when you're there. It's too enormous and too paradoxical a place to identify with uh, totally unless you're, you know, a Yahoo rooting for like 
all the American guys at the Olympics or something. I'm an American. Go Americans. In fact, every American instead substitutes, and perhaps it's even self-indulgent in some ways, but I think it's really true, substitutes some version of a, of a marginal identity so that they may feel oppressed by the rest of America. And so being a New Yorker, for instance, or being a Southerner, or being, you know, uh, you, you always identify uh, by your uh, shred of immigrant status. I mean, one, one famous thing is that every Midwestern family, and my, I, I have this on my father's side because my father is a, from a five generations Protestant Missouri Midwest uh, farm belt family, but every family like ours claims some, that somewhere there's some Native American blood. <laughs> you know, this is a, a form of that indulgent, uh, uh, the seeking of a marginal, a kind of a grievance, so that the rest of America can be um, taken as a kind of the, the norm and you're working some kind of angle or margin. Uh, you've got some special uh, peripheral identity. And, you know, and I would claim that some of mine are authentic. I mean, I grew up in, in a, in a what's commonly called a red diaper family. We were sort of, in various awkward ways, we, we had um, a co communist uh, affiliations. They were kind of muffled. I didn't really know the word communist growing up. It had been kind of, you know, the, the, the truth about our family was hidden even from me, but that was sort of making us feel very marginal. And, and my father, this good Midwestern with a shred of Indian uh, Mohawk <laughs> blood, had married a, a New York Jew. So we were a kind of odd mongrel family. And, and we weren't even central in our New York identity. We were Brooklynites, which was a kind of disaffiliated New York identity. We had a big chip on our shoulder about Manhattan. <laughs> and it's always this kind of seeking of uh, specific marginal affiliations that really I think generates so much of what we then export as American culture. I mean, obviously, uh, hip hop and jazz come from a, an exiled form of American identity. Internal exile suffered by the, the black underclass generates enormous amounts of what then becomes, you know, obnoxious, uh, you know, baseball hats worn backwards, right, and, and <laughs> low slung jeans. But that originates with a sense of defiance and, um, you know, uh, navigating a, 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 a dominant majority from an impossible position of disadvantage. Well, that, well, that answer has taken us in a, in a new direction of identity and, and marginality. Uh, but let me open up the, um, the, the, uh, to the floor. I'm, I'm sure lots of you have have questions that you'd love to ask. Uh, there's a roving mic at the back, so uh, please just uh, put your hand up and ask away. It can be about Mad Magazine or Prince, too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, it's, it's not quite Mad Magazine or Prince, but uh, 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 you are sort of an expert on Philip Dick. And I was wondering, in your talk, you mentioned Dickens, who was kind of the Pulp Fiction writer of his day. I mean, we've elevated him to yeah. put him on a pedestal. But I'm wondering, how much did he, how much did Dick uh, influence you to sort of just allow cultural references to be there. I, I think Dick's particularly sort of the advertising culture yes, of the 50s and the 60s. Yeah. Well, Philip K. Dick was an enormously important writer for me and, and has continued to nourish my, my writing. I mean, I, a, a fairly recent novel, Chronic City, was an attempt for me to go back and replenish, in a way, under his influence and look at uh, post-9-11 New York City as, as he would as a kind of paranoid simulacrum of a city. Um, he, and yes, to, to go right to your question, which, which contains so many nice implications, you know, one of the things that I um, figured out, but it took me a very long time to figure it out, was that I'd grown up really in the shadow of uh, World War II. I mean, I still think we're in the shadow of World War II in so many ways. But because my parents were sort of 
Age of Aquarius types. Growing up in the 60s and 70s, I felt that World War II was ancient history. It feels much closer to me now. But I was always finding it under every rock. I mean, just right behind the 60s culture that seemed so forward-looking and, and, and trans, tr transformational and attractive to me, you know, behind like Richard Brodigan novels or, or Philip K. Dick novels, psychedelia and rock and roll, all these really exciting things. There always was this sort of lurking Cold War paranoid, you know, 1950s culture just still there. And it seemed really important to me. I, I would see the Twilight Zone episodes. I, Rod Serling, uh, you know, w was this doorway into the world that my parents had grown up inside. And things like old Lenny Bruce records, where under the regime of, you know, our, our, our late 40s, 1950s, this sort of the invention of the tri triumphant capitalist America stuck in a Cold War with this dark, shadowy, Iron Curtain communism, there was the, the answer to a lot of what was the truth about the world I lived in seemed to be hiding there. And Dick was writing about that so directly. I really think he is, with, you know, with Lenny Bruce and with Rod Serling and with the, you know, the film noir directors, he was cracking open the skin of what it was like in the 1950s. That seamless, you know, world of where we were all persuading ourselves that, that the American way was just a kind of a finished product, that everyone would have the, the two-car garage and, and, and um, that once we licked communism that everything would be great in the world and that uh, the only real problem might be that there were subversives in our own society. You know, this kind of really conformist uh, vision needed to be cracked open by really radical sensibilities like Lenny Bruce and Philip K. Dick. And they gave birth to the world that I came, came of age inside. You know, rock and roll and punk rock and psychedelia and, uh, you know, and Mag Mad, Mad Magazine was right, right inside that, that critique too, I think. So he's very important writer to me in the way he was able to, to look at American life. But he seemed a very disreputable character. I mean, now he's taught in universities and stuff. But when I was reading him in out-of-print pulp paperbacks in the 70s, he seemed much more, much closer to, to a comic book than to literature. Well, not to mention these days all the Hollywood blockbusters based right. on his stories. Right. Um, questions? Yes. Um, you were talking about how, how big visual art was as a, um, I mean, in mostly your younger days, uh, and just informed so much of, of who you were. Do you still do you still paint? Well, I have these two little kids who like me to draw for them and with them. So I'm actually handling like crayons and a paintbrush and, and you know, or just drawing with a pen on 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 um, you know printer paper so much more than I have in such a long time. And it's really fun to reanimate the, just the physical act as it's been surprisingly rich for me. But the uh, ambition evaporated totally. I'm so fulfilled as a, as a writer of stories and, and novels. I mean, it, in fact, all the other parallel ambitions. I don't, you know, I love film and I think about it all the time. I don't have any desire to make a film or to make a comic book or to make paintings or sculptures in a serious or ambitious way because I'm just so, you know, it was such a consummation for me when I figured out I could, I could become a novelist and I would write books that people would want to read. It just took care of every scrap of ambition. So when I, when I draw now and I like to, it's just sort of like a fun, it's like a sport or something. Oh, look, I can kind of make that look. And the kids like it a lot. They really like it a lot. So that's, that's great. It's sort of like I went from impressing my dad with it to impressing my kids with it. <laughs> it sounds a little bit from that, that you, 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 painting for you is something you, you've done for other people, and uh, whereas uh, the writing seems to come so much from within yeah. yourself. Well, yeah, the painting turned out to be a social, mm. uh, you know, that, that my, my art skills turned out to have this social value that was really enriching once I located my aspirations elsewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Yes, there's, uh, well, there's three here. One, uh, the gentleman at the back, and then this gentleman, and uh, is there somebody else? Yeah, the lady over there. Um, I wanted to go back to you using cultural references to add color to the fiction. Um, one of the fears was if people were outside of familiarity with the reference, uh, it wouldn't be accessible to them. Um, I was wondering if you could talk more of how the reference operates to add color to the fiction in terms of is it just the abundance of culture? Because you talked about how we're sort of inundated with it everywhere. Or is it the actual reference itself, like how the music makes someone feel or how an environment is? Because if it's the latter, it still seems like it would potentially it alienate people. It could be dependent on yeah. familiarity. That's a great question because it really, it really sharpens up something that I, I was uh, leaving a little bit, uh, I was letting converge. I think there's two things. One is the immersive abundance of cultural texture. You know, that kind of falling into a Dickens novel the way you fall into an ocean. And you, you only really can see a couple of inches in front of your face and what you meet might be strange, might be familiar, but you feel this powerful sense of uh, the real property of existence in, in, the, in the act of immersion. You're connected to the whole ocean, even if you can't comprehend it or see its depths. And that would be a matter of letting yourself, which is, you know, also, of course, a risk of becoming prolix or just, you know, um, too verbose. But letting yourself add a lot of cultural detail uh, because you know it has a value in and, in and of itself as a kind of uh, world substitute. You know, and I, I've, come to, I've come to write longer novels, partly because I've become more interested in their ability to substitute for the world. Once I started using more cultural references, um, I, I just got interested in what you might almost call thicker textures. You know, and it does slow the narrative down, and I'm sure there are people, you know, you can't do all things well at once in a given book, and I'm sure there are people who, you know, liked being able to kind of tear through my stories because they were sometimes very fast-moving stories, and I'm definitely not providing that service anymore. I just can't. <laughs> um, but the immersion started to seem like really, really, the thick texture seemed really uh, nourishing to me in a way that was worth sacrificing uh, uh, concision for, at least uh, in, 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 at some, you know, it was, it was always a negotiation. How, you know, time in fiction is really, really strange. Because you can make a moment take up 50 pages and you can, or you can bury it implicitly in a, between two sentences and have it not represented on the page at all. Time is so plastic. Um, but the other thing, which is the, where you make a slightly larger commitment to a reference, like the way um, the character in sixth grade in The Fortress of Solitude uh, feels about that song, Play That Funky Music. It's tricky. You either have to describe the thing a lot and, and make sure it's, you know, and I did. I just, I, 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 I obviously I can't have, it's not like a link in a website where I can have a song suddenly play when you run your eyes over the, that part of the text. But I think that I just knew that I had to bring that song to life as a problem and a, and a kind of like a burden and a, 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 an energy for this character. So I devoted some time to, to describing it. Now, how that will work when certain frameworks fall away, like when maybe music doesn't come in three-minute pop songs anymore, or the word funky sounds, you know, like something out of a medieval manuscript does to us now. <laughs> I, I can only worry about those to a certain extent. You know, posterity becomes this sort of fool's errand. I have to write for present, the present life of my present readers. And, and, you know, if God knows, you know, I mean, basically, we, we skip along remembering about three writers per century, right? If somehow I am graced with that reference needing to be like a footnote, the way a lot of things in a Shakespeare text are footnoted now, well, it's like I won the lottery. But the chances are, however good a job I did on that book, it's for my contemporaries. That's who I'm writing for. So I just have to make sure it can work on those terms. And getting obsessed with making your work uh, 
modular forever. I, you know, it's I. Who knows? Even even the Beethoven and the, and the Rothko are culturally specific. They have frameworks and contexts that animate their meaning. The space of a museum, windows, the his, the historical tradition that brought those paintings to to come to be could dissolve. And they might not mean anything either. So you can't you can't worry about that. I know there are competing events that people may want to go off for, but I, I did indicate that there could be two more questions. If perhaps both questions could be asked at the same time. You were, did you do you still want to ask a question? Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so why don't you do that and then uh, the other one and then well, I'm just uh, curious about, uh, especially about fiction writing, in your type of writing especially. Now, um, now we create work, or we, we create geography, we create locations in work of fiction. Now, can't certain culture be fabricated as well to ma also make it credible and um, believable? I think I don't understand the question in there. Okay, I'm interesting. Say, yeah. Okay, like... Okay, in your kind of work, all right, uh, can culture be fabricated? Oh, you mean when I was sort of trying to make up? Yes. Yeah, well, it was a great sport for me. And, and you know, one of the interesting things is I circled back to it. I started to realize after, you know, in um, Fortress of Solitude, which is, a, you know, really kind of a watershed book for me because I just, I treat the cultural world as a kind of documentary space. I try to bring it to life with enormous accuracy and then drop fictional characters into that documentary space, you know, 1970s Brooklyn. Um, later, in, in Chronic City, I started to become interested in doing both my old method and my new method. I put in a lot of real culture and I made up, you know, things that didn't exist. I made up bands that didn't exist and I put them into real histories. Yeah. I, I, I put Marlon Brando into movies that don't exist. Yeah. And, and people became quite uh, richly confused. I actually had a fact checker at The New Yorker tell me that my made up band had never played at CBGB's and that I had to take it out of the book. Because she, uh, she thought that they were real and she, that she, could, she, could, she had done research that proved that they'd never played there. Um, <laughs> And, um, and so the vibration that, between these imaginary cultural legacies and real ones, but truthfully, to get the thick texture, I mean, I really think that the world is much stranger than anything and much more extensive. I mean, no, novel writing, even, even writing very long novels, is still a tremendous act of reduction and selection of reality. Oh, yeah. I mean, we know when we look at a poem or, you know, or like a... a one act play, we know life has been shrunken into kind of a kabuki version of itself, a tiny little gesture standing in for all of it. When we read a Dickens novel or a, a Saul Bellow novel or some other thickly described book, we can be deceived briefly into the idea that it's as big and full and complex as life, but it's still kabuki. It's still a total reduction. So much has been excluded to, to, to make those pages fit inside a book. The world is... Uh, incomprehensibly larger than even, you know, uh, Proust or the largest novels that were ever written. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Last, last question. Hi. Uh, my question is actually closely related to yours. It might, in fact, be redundant. Oh, okay. Uh, there, there's, <laughs> there's one gentleman who had his hand up. Let, let us pass it to him. There's this gentleman here in the brown sweater. You, you have Gazamta. Come on. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for your lecture. Thank you. Yes. Um, I can't finally sleep waking up for me, sleep waking up. Um, just a simple question. Would you consider uh, your fiction speculative? Oh, well, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, I always liked that word uh, because it seemed like a, um, a, a nice substitute for the really, you know, science fiction has this really uh, Broken name. It's not you know. It's not scientific. The stuff I like, and certainly the stuff I wrote or was capable of writing, isn't really scientific in any uh, regard. But this idea of speculation, or uh, there was a term I liked even better, was cognitive estrangement. Fictions of cognitive estrangement, uh, which is you know, it brings together the idea of uh, 
well, you know, Keats has this idea of negative capability that you, in a sense that in writing you must aspire to be other than yourself. Now, of course, you're yourself. You're stuck. So it's the aspiration, the attempt to push outside of the limit of yourself, and the tension between that and the unmistakable fact that you'll always revert to, 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 to your own voice and your own perspective. You're stuck you're inside your own consciousness forever. It's a tomb or a prison if you want to be, you know, uh, do me about it. Um, but the reaching is so important. Well, cognitive estrangement is to take that and make it a matter that's not about the self, the individual self, but about the world. It's fictions that try to make the world other than it is in order to see, in order to feel what experience is like by, by altering speculating or extrapolating, you, you're pushing the world out of itself. Of course it's itself, but you've seen it differently. I, I feel as though I have another hundred questions I'd like to ask you, but unfortunately we, um, we really have to bring things to a close. So first of all, can I just remind everyone that Jonathan will be outside uh, and will you know, happily, I believe, sign, sign books. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, uh, after this. And secondly, can I uh, thank Jonathan for you know, honoring us by coming all the way here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.